good afternoon. I know it's been a really excellent uh, program so far, and uh, thank you for making it back from lunch in a timely fashion. Uh, we'll now have an opportunity to talk about uh, one of the most important regions, obviously, uh, for the subject of this uh, forum, uh, global energy. When one thinks about uh, energy, one has to think about Saudi Arabia, and one has to think about the changes that are going on in the structure of markets, uh, the changes that are going on in Saudi Arabia itself to try to adjust to that. And so we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. I understand we will have some questions that have been uh, submitted by the audience. And so, Mr. Ambassador, you and I will go on for 10, 15 minutes and then try to uh, involve the uh, audience. Well, these are obviously uh, complicated times. And I think that uh, we would be remiss if we didn't start by asking a question about uh, the US-Saudi relationship in general. You have been at the UN for seven years. You've been a guardian of uh, the relationships of Saudi Arabia around the world. It's obviously a complicated time after the uh, tragic, indeed ghastly, uh, death of Mr. Koshigi. So I would just like you to talk a little bit about how you think we uh, handle the relationship this time. How do we keep it on track? Um, what needs to be done on all sides? Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you on this uh, panel. It's a special pleasure for me to come back to my alma mater, Stanford, uh, I was here a long time ago. I'm not going to tell you when. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a lot of things have changed, but nothing, the, the thing that hasn't changed at all is the spirit that you see in, in Stanford. Uh, and I was delighted to see all the lively young men and women on campus. The only thing is that they look at me, at me as an alien coming from a different age. <laughs> But thank you, Madam Secretary, for uh, starting with this uh, subject. Saudi-American relations are, of course, very crucial and very strategic. And I think they are built on solid foundations of common interests and common values. Uh, this relationship has uh, been uh, for a long time. It's not new. It's in, since the 1930s, ever since the historic meeting between the late President Roosevelt and the late King Abdulaziz that cemented the relationship between two emerging powers in, in, in the United States in the world and Saudi Arabia in, in the region. <clears throat> we've gone through more than 10 administrations. We've gone through more than six kings during this period of time. And the relationship continues to be resilient, continues to be strong. And in fact, during the current administration of President Trump and the current reign of King Salman, I believe that the relationship has grown and has uh, strengthened to probably unprecedented times. Uh, I believe one of the main reasons, the essential reasons, is that both countries are important for each other. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not only the leading energy and, and oil producer, uh, but is also the moral central ground for, the, for more than one and a half billion Muslims throughout the world. And, and that is a major component of the strength and, and the position of Saudi Arabia. Obviously, you refer to the recent uh, incident with uh, Mr. Khashoggi. Let me just be, be very clear. This is uh, a heinous crime that should be condemned by all people whatsoever. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has, uh, does not hesitate in, in declaring it as such and in putting all efforts behind the investigation and the uh, uh, search for the exact truth in, in, in this particular situation. So I hope that we will have uh, clarity and we will have closure. And I hope that this incident will, uh, uh, will be seen and will be treated as it is, which is an individual crime that has been committed by uh, uh, people who had no authority to commit such a crime. No one can have the authority to commit uh, such, a, such a crime. Uh, I think in the light of the things that have happened, I can see that uh, even with this uh, situation happening, the relationship is proving its resilience. Uh, there are those on both sides who may want to use this opportunity to weaken it, but I think that 
uh, wiser minds and, and souls are recognizing that uh, whatever happens, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States need each other for the stability of the world and for the uh, progress and, and for the common interests that both countries have. Well, thank you very much. And, and you mentioned the word clarity and one could say also transparency. And it's an especially important time for this because uh, the nature of Saudi Arabia itself and its relationship to the world and to international markets is changing uh, because Saudi Arabia has made a decision to try to open up to uh, international investment, to international markets, uh, driven in part by the importance of the diversification of the economy given changes in global oil markets. Um, I was Secretary of State when oil went to $145 a barrel. And, uh, Come back. Come yeah, back. and <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't so great if you were the American Secretary of State. I just want to tell you that. But uh, after the crisis, um, oil fell to one fourth of that value. And even though we're accustomed to volatility in oil markets, I think there's a general sense that the structural change in oil markets, we'll talk about the North American platform in the next panel, that the structure, structural changes are such that people are going to have to adjust not to volatility, but to, not just to volatility, but also to structural. So as my, under, my understanding is that this was uh, the inspiration for the efforts uh, of uh, diversification, um, the uh, Saudi 2030, and so can you talk a little bit about the rationale and how you think it's going? Thank you. Uh, there are two or three key points that I'd like to highlight. Number one, Saudi Arabia is committed to diversification of its economy and of its sources of revenue. Now, we've been saying that for a long time and little to show for it over the past decade or more. But the difference now is that we have a specific plan, Vision 2030, that identifies ways and means by which we are going to do that. And in fact, we are starting uh, to achieve results over the uh, first two or three years of, of the plan. So, so we now not only say that we want to diversify, but we are telling the world and telling our own people how are we going to do it and what are the steps in, in, in the process. Uh, number two, uh, I would say Saudi Arabia is committed to uh, stability of the oil markets. Uh, we have been instrumental in maintaining uh, balance between supply and demand. We have been instrumental in, in trying to uh, moderate prices and keep them at, at a reasonable level or within a reasonable range. We have done so at difficult times. We have done so at times when we did not have uh, as much power to, to achieve these results. And we have done so at times when we did have that, that, that power. Uh, and we, we do it because we believe in the long-term vision of the oil markets. It's not in our interest to go to 140 or 150 for a short period of time and then be faced with sharp reductions in consumption or in demand or, or in prices as, as a result. We, we are there for the long run. And number three, the third point to add, is that we are in Saudi Arabia going through nothing less than, uh, some people may hate the word, but I'll use it, revolution. It is a social and soft revolution that is taking place in Saudi Arabia. It is changing attitudes, it is changing the, the society in many ways. Of course, women empowerment is a big part of it, opening up the society and instilling in the system a much higher degree of transparency and accountability. And I think with those elements, we are able to attract and encourage uh, international participants. So, so this is, I believe, these are the three major factors in the new era that Saudi Arabia is going through at the moment. Well, thank you. In, in fact, uh, one of the hard things in governing, because you were right, I was in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh Last December, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, the Crown Prince for an extended period of time and to listen to his uh, views about reform. It's quite obvious when you're in Saudi Arabia that young people are energized by the reform in ways that I think uh, we've not seen in a long time. But every governing body, every governing structure has to balance 
short-term interests, short-term economic growth with a longer-term horizon, uh, that transition can be very, very difficult. And it's especially difficult if you're going from a state-run economy, essentially since oil was such a, a big part of the Saudi economy, to one that is going to be more dependent on markets and on uh, the efforts of uh, to bring in foreign investments. So uh, will Saudi Arabia be patient enough to make the transition this time? Because I think that one of the reasons that uh, those efforts that you talked about before didn't really come to fruition was that uh, when the price of oil was up, uh, it was easy to forget about the reforms. When the price of, of oil was down, people talked about diversification, and then price of oil was up again, and the efforts of diversification were laid aside. And so how do you think about the short-term, long-term balance here? You, you are exactly right in, in your description. And the reason that that has happened is because we did not have a long-term plan. Uh, the difference today is that, A, we have a long-term plan. B, we have the determination of the leadership to stick to the plan, even though it might be painful. And indeed, it has been painful over the past one or two years with the increase in price of energy, uh, of electricity, of gas, and everything for the uh, people in, in, in Saudi Arabia. But we have seen the results. The results is that our own consumption of oil has declined by almost a third as a result of introducing uh, market factors and, and proper pricing. And, and that process is, is, is proceeding. So we, we have leadership that is now looking over the long horizon, over the long term, uh, as opposed to facing the immediate pressures uh, that may arise from, from here or there. And I think we've demonstrated that over the past two or three years. We've gone through some of the most difficult adjustments, and we still have some more adjustments to go through. Uh, but I, I think we will, we will show the, the way for uh, a process of transformation that is genuinely taking place. How do we think about Saudi Aramco in that context? Uh, because there was a lot of um, uh, energy behind the possibility of an IPO. A lot of markets were out, a lot of exchanges were out there bidding to be the one that got Saudi Aramco. And then uh, it clearly slowed. And uh, there is a little bit of a danger in sometimes getting out ahead uh, of with an announcement like that and then realizing that the transition is going to be somewhat slower. So how, do, how should we think about Saudi Aramco in this context? Well, uh, the IPO of Saudi, of Saudi Aramco or parts of, a part of Saudi Aramco would have been a very important step and a very major step. And it is not unusual for such steps to be fraught with uh, caution, with, with uh, even risks uh, at times, and to be uh, exercised with, with a fair degree of, uh, of care and attention. And I think that's what's happening. I think there was also a need for more public debate inside Saudi Arabia about uh, the IPO of Aramco. There are philosophical issues as to whether you should sell part of the future resources of, of, of uh, the coming generations, or whether you're actually securing those uh, generations with alternative investments and possibilities. That's a lively debate that is taking place in Saudi Arabia, and that probably needed time alongside the time that was needed for the technical preparations and so forth. Uh, I think the uh, Crown Prince is still committed to the concept of privatizing Aramco. He believes that having the uh, uh, private sector involved in the ownership and leadership of Aramco is going to make it more transparent, is going to make it more efficient, uh, and so forth. And I think that these objectives are, are still valid. Uh, the question of the timing is something where uh, a certain degree of flexibility may have to be exercised. Well, if indeed uh, the idea was to jumpstart uh, greater innovation, uh, greater openness to technologies that would come from the outside, are there things that can be done in the meantime uh, to attract uh, investment? Um, because it, the investment brings with it a certain innovation and, and uh, technological progress. And how do you think about technology in this uh, well, Aramco is already a leading power in, uh, in many of the uh, technology areas that, that need to be done. We spoke this morning, the speakers talked about 
CO2 storage and capture, capture and storage, uh, and so forth. And I think that Aramco is one of the leading powers in research and development and investment behind uh, that process. Uh, you may have noticed that in the past couple of years or three years, the Ministry of Petroleum and Mineral Resources have been transformed to become the Ministry of Energy. Uh, and therefore, it expanded the role of uh, uh, energy and, and the role of the ministry from looking after oil uh, alone to, to looking at the whole uh, sector. And that involves nuclear, it involves solar, it involves uh, wind energy and, and so forth. And the investments that are lined up behind those alternative sources of energy, the more renewable sources of energy, uh, are, are tremendous. And Aramco is a leading uh, power within, within that uh, direction. Aramco is likely to take over a major share in the national uh, petrochemical industry giant, SABIC. Uh, and that will mean that Aramco will also be integrated not only in the energy sector and, and renewable energies, but also in the petrochemical sector and will make it more along the lines of the Exxons of the world and, and others who have made such a transformation in, in, in the past. So Aramco is heavily involved in, in that process. Uh, it is being supported by research institutions within Saudi Arabia and outside Saudi Arabia. And uh, I think you will see that there will be uh, a great deal of uh, uh, desire on the part of the technology holders to, to work with Aramco, co-invest in Saudi Arabia, outside Saudi Arabia, and help build and develop the necessary technologies. Uh, absolutely. Uh, on the technology side, I would completely agree. I was a Chevron director. Um, mm -hmm. My first trip to Saudi Arabia was actually as a Chevron director. As you know, Standard Oil was really the first uh, of the American companies to have those relationships. And so obviously a leader on the technological side. Uh, the question that some in Saudi Arabia itself uh, have, have asked is about the human uh, potential side. In other words, uh, the training and skills that uh, Saudi, the Saudi population might need uh, to really take advantage of these new frontiers. And uh, whether or not there are actually impacts on the educational system and uh, how people are trained. So, and, and by the way, not trained just at the highest levels, but trained down through the population. Well, I have to concede that education is one of our uh, most important challenges in, in Saudi Arabia. And this is a subject that is not limited to Aramco. Aramco has excellent training programs and they, they develop their own human resources uh, needs uh, very effectively. But at the country at large, education remains a big challenge in, in terms of the quality of the substance and in terms of the quality of the methods of teaching and in terms of the uh, interaction between the technology, the classroom, and, and the family uh, at, at home. And I think that that is something that we still need to work a lot more on. And uh, there are numerous steps and, and numerous efforts in that direction but I think a lot more needs to be done. Yeah. I'll come back to uh, oil. I want to ask you a question about uh, OPEC and yes. what it means in this world. But I want to just continue on education for <coughs> just a moment, if I may. Uh, you were trained here in the United States, as a matter of fact, right here at Stanford. <laughs> uh, when I talked often to, at the time, King Abdullah, he uh, mentioned the fact that there had actually been a drop off for a period of time in Saudi students being trained abroad. He, of course, created one of the great universities um, in, and put a $10 billion investment into that university. And indeed, one of the characteristics was that women would also be trained yes. within that university. And I remember not really wanting to ask the king whether women and men would mm -hmm. go to school together. Uh, the answer was, in fact, yes. One of the real breakthroughs has been actually in the education of women. Uh, at least a couple of years ago, uh, Saudi was training more women in their universities than men. So talk a little bit about that and how that might change. You talked earlier about societal reform. Um, I do remember saying to people that Saudi was going to be on a bit of a high wire if you wanted to 
educate that many women and give them no voice. And so uh, talk a little bit about how that is uh, well, proceeding. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, before the recent initiatives were, were taken, initiatives such as allowing women the right to drive, such as allowing women the right to attend uh, football uh, stadia, the, the right to attend concerts and theaters and movies and, and so forth. Before all of that happened, there were those who were you know, howling and shouting and assuming and expecting that uh, uh, all hell will break loose because women will be out there in the public and, and, and men, those men cannot be trusted and they will all be uh, on their feet and on their, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, trying to find out what to do to, uh, in, in, in that game. Well, you know, I have news for you and for everybody. This thing went smoothly. The number of women who are being harassed in the streets as they drive is extremely low. The number of women who are being harassed in, uh, in stadia and so forth is almost non-existent. And, and the whole process is going through smoothly. The same can be said about women in, uh, in education, especially in higher education. Uh, King Abdullah University has uh, a uh, co-educational uh, student body, including professors, not only students, but also professors. Uh, a lot of other universities are gradually following, following uh, suit. And uh, today, almost 60% of all college students are female. Uh, the other part is you talked about the King Abdullah scholarship program. Today in the United States, there are probably around 100,000 Saudi students who are on, on scholarship programs from the Saudi government, 30% of whom are, are, are women. Now, the next challenge is, is going to provide job opportunities for all the women who come uh, from abroad or who graduate from the local universities. And I think that that is going to be an important step, and it's going to have significant social impact because men will become much more used to working with women, encountering women in the workplace, and women will have an opportunity to demonstrate, uh, of course, their abilities and contributions to society. Thank you. Um, we'll go back now to a couple of questions about international oil markets. and. Uh, if you do have questions, please submit them and uh, we will take them up with the ambassador. But uh, there are four letters that strike fear into the hearts of oil importers. O-P-E-C. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a teenager, um, I think I was a teenager, maybe truthfully I was already 20 or so, <laughs> but um, at the, the time of the um, oil shock in the uh, 19, early 1970s, when what happened in the Middle East brought very much to the American uh, service station, to the American family, a sense of what could happen when uh, oil became a political weapon, so to speak. Um, that's the OPEC that still many people remember. How should we think about OPEC today? How should we think about the various members of it? Um, is it a, it's obviously a different organization than at that time, but how well, different? It is, it is a different organization for a variety of reasons. Number one, the political landscape is different. And number two, the percentage of oil that comes from OPEC countries has declined substantially with the rise of production in the United States and elsewhere. And number three, the relative strength of the players within OPEC has, has also become very different. You have in OPEC those who have uh, small uh, inventories of oil, small reservoirs, and as such, and, and, and tremendous financial needs, and therefore for them, the objective is to hike the price as high as possible. You have those like Saudi Arabia who have a much longer term vision of, of the uh, markets. Uh, for the last 40 years or so, Saudi Arabia has played a moderating role, a responsible role, uh, a very constructive role in keeping OPEC within certain uh, parameters that, that meet the requirements uh, and the interests of the OPEC members, as well as take into consideration the interests of the consumers and, and the international community. 
And as long as that is the case, then I think there will be little or no reason for concern. Uh, as I said, there are others who may have different interests. Iran, in particular, has a different approach, uh, not only to OPEC, but also to the region as a whole. And, and that is why Saudi Arabia and the United States are working together to try to contain Iran uh, as much as possible and to reduce the impact of, of their policies. And Russia? <clears throat> well, uh, Russia has played a constructive role in the last few years. It has joined Saudi Arabia in trying to maintain a reasonable balance. Uh, Russia also has a large production and, and significant reserves, and therefore I think it's in their interest to, to play the market uh, positively and constructively. And so you would say... And when, Russia is not a member of OPEC. No, no, <laughs> but the relationship with OPEC <laughs> yes. is what I'm really asking yes. about. No, the, but the question, and you're telling us that if you look at what states will do in the oil markets in terms of policy, look not at their politics and their international or foreign policy, but look at where they sit uh, in terms of their own oil reserves, their own position in the international system? Is that, is that going too far? Is that uh, the no, right think, way to think about it? I think that's it? a key a key consideration. Of course, some may be driven by ideology, some may be driven by political desires to achieve certain objectives. I'm talking here particularly about Iran, uh, where the policies may not necessarily reflect economic sense or economic reason. But by and large, I think that economic sense and reason would, would prevail. And in, in many cases, the relative influence of Saudi Arabia within, within OPEC would make it prevail. Let me ask you um, two final questions that are kind of more broad political questions. Um, one has to do, and you've touched on it, uh, the politics of the region and Iran. Uh, we know it's a very complicated <coughs> time in the politics of the region uh, with the war in Yemen and uh, the uh, divorce, I guess I should call it, from Qatar. Um, how should we think about, when, when we think about uh, the Middle East and oil markets, people want to know what should we think about the stability of the region. Um, how should we think about the stability of the region at a time when the world is still very dependent on uh, the Middle East for oil? Uh, it, uh, we'll talk about North America, which is obviously uh, a huge player, but the world still needs uh, Middle Eastern oil. How should we think about the stability? In Islam, divorce is a three-stage process, and we've only <laughs> gone through one stage with Qatar, so we still have two stages more to, <laughs> to bring things together, and I think and I hope that that will be the case at some point of time. But there are two major destabilizing forces in the region. One is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and as long as that conflict uh, is maintained, and as long as it does not find a, a reasonable solution, a fair and just and comprehensive solution that meets the aspirations of the Palestinian people and that provides Israel with the security it needs. As long as that does not take place, we will continue to have uh, a reason for instability in, in, in the region. And to that extent, I hope that the United States will continue to exercise its influence as much as possible uh, to try to bring such a solution uh, uh, to reality. <clears throat> the second is the expansionist, the ideological, hemogenic uh, uh, policies uh, that Iran is trying to, to drive through. And uh, if you look at the region, if you look at Saudi Arabia, Iran is trying to actually encircle Saudi Arabia, going through Iraq and Syria and Lebanon in the north, and now coming through Yemen in, in, in the south. This process needs to be defeated, and, and we are... Uh, working very hard to, to, to achieve that, especially in Yemen, where uh, uh, we cannot accept the presence of another Hezbollah on our southern, southern border. Uh, and I think that the majority of the Yemeni people do not want a return to the dark ages of a theological, theocratic uh, government in Yemen along the lines of Iran. Iran have never produced a model of government that is appealing to the masses. They, they appeal to emotions, they appeal to extremists, they appeal to their own uh, interests sometimes, but they have never been able to, to provide the Middle East with a model of leadership, of development, of uh, 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 welfare for the people, etc. 
So uh, that is going to be the, the second challenge to, to help uh, bring stability in, in, in the Middle East. And, and again, I'm glad that the United States and Saudi Arabia are working together to try to uh, uh, face up to this challenge. So final question, you have <coughs> gathered before you uh, a, a quite uh, expansive and, and eminent group of people who follow energy, uh, who are part of the uh, future of energy. The Stanford Energy Forum is really dedicated to understanding the entire uh, energy uh, landscape. Uh, what would you say to this audience in closing about where at the end of 2030 uh, one would think Saudi Arabia should be? What is the aspiration and uh, what is the challenge to getting there? Well, we certainly hope, I certainly hope as a Saudi citizen that by 2030 or even before that, that we would have Saudi Arabia as a modern country as an open country, as a country that has a diversified economy, as a country that is a beacon of knowledge and civilization to the region, to the entire world, uh, a country that, that attracts uh, tourists and investors, a country that uh, exports uh, different types of energy, not only oil and gas, but also solar and, and, and others. Uh, and a country that can continue to be and will, will continue to be a reliable partner in, in uh, maintaining peace and stability and, and economic prosperity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the ambassador for his. Thank you. Thank you very much.